your area of responsibility. My role is not to tell you what to do, right? We hire experts not to, uh, not to tell them what to do. We hire experts so they can tell us what to do in this area. My job in this situation is to, uh, to pave your way, to, to clear out the obstacles left and right. And at some point, some engineers at this point, they don't, they cannot live up with it. They get scared. They, they act like, yeah. okay, uh, wash me, but don't get me wet. Acknowledge that there is experience that you don't have. I mean, how could it be any other way if you're just 28? Now, it's pretty rare that I get someone on the show with over 20 years experience in the tech space. The nature of the beast means that usually it's a young person's game. But Lucas Weber, who's the co-founder of Vimcart in Berlin, started his career way back in 1999, and he joins me on the show today. Now, over the last 20 years, Lucas has seen the lot from booms to busts. He's worked his way up tech companies from software engineer to manager and built a very successful tech company too. Now, the value I got from this conversation was that he had the context of 20 years of experience. So he's really able to zoom out of situations and problems and short term cycles to see the bigger picture, to plan ahead. And most importantly, to give advice to people who just don't have that level of experience. For a young person like myself who hasn't been through all the cycles, it was immensely valuable. And I absolutely loved picking his brains for an hour or so. So let's get this one started. Without further ado, I'm Alex Loisey, and this is the Building Our World podcast. So, Lucas, thank you so much for coming on the show. I wanted to bring you right back to the start. If your LinkedIn profile is correct, you graduated back in 1999. So what I love to do is to get yourself to think about the person you were back then and how you were going to view the next 20 years of your life. As you were coming out into the world, how did you see things pan out for you? I mean, there's, I've, I've had this question a couple of times. For me, there's two things to, to mention here. One is uh, I started uh, getting into software development when I was 12, like a typical Commodore six, C64 kitty. So it wasn't a conscious choice to join tech. It just so happened to be there all my life, right? And the other thing, the what's fundamentally different if you look at 1999 compared to now is there have been maybe like three startups in Berlin, if, right? So this was like this really? overseas wow. thing. I mean, big ones. Um, yeah. It sort of was like nobody actually knew how uh, startups work, what they are. It was this American kind of thing. And of course, it was for me, so, uh, somebody as somebody who did uh, programming all his life, it was very interesting, right? Because you get a lot of degrees of freedom and nobody really knew knew what would be coming out of this, right? And that's fundamentally different in a way that now you're looking at a startup industry in Berlin, right? In yeah. other major cities, right? You have job markets, you have uh, clear job descriptions, you have clear areas of responsibility. All that was like blurred back then. And it was this rather small community of tech enthusiasts, right? So this is, uh, give you the answer on how I looked at it. Uh, just felt for me the thing to do, right? And mm. of course, there was this sense of uh, understanding that this would grow bigger over the years, um, that this entire thing turned into such a big industry with so many processes and positions sorted out. Wasn't that clear at this moment, right? But we are mm. talking about 20 years here. So. Yeah. So you were, when you were co- coming out of all this, you were viewing yourself as an engineer and, and not say an entrepreneur, if you had to label yourself back then? Yes, more, even more as a, a technology, right? So engineer, what's an engineer? It sounds like, like uh, building uh, motorcycle yeah. engines or something, right? But a software, software engineer, engineer yeah. uh, we, fer- we felt pretty, pretty nerdy, yes. This like small mm-hmm. tech community that I mentioned before. Yeah. We sort of knew and- like most of the other people, right? Yeah. And this was 
was this sort of during the boom because the dot com crash i don't know how affected europe was mm. that was around 2000 wasn't it exactly 2000 2001 yeah well and i mean lasted into 2003 actually yeah so for for people many people listening will be sort of my age as well so i was about six years old when this happened so mm. um and it might sort of draw some comparisons to what's happening in the market now um mm. so i mean how did the dot-com crash play out and, and is it similar to what's happening now or was it a different phenomenon um i think it was different in a way that it was the first crash um, and especially was different in a way that uh, regarding Berlin I mean just consider the exchange rate between dollar and, and euros back then right so yeah. having some American investor in a city like Berlin that uh, was very cheap to to live and to to rent space uh, um, financing wasn't really the issue it was all a bit abstract anyway and now it's yeah. a lot tighter uh, for for startups to survive these kind of things um, so I think it was fundamentally different. Of course, I, I knew a bunch of people who lost money because they invested in, in, in stocks back then. I didn't because I was, as, as the tech guy, I was just interested in engineering. I wasn't into mm. uh, business development yet, right? So it was different, very different in a way because it was a, like this distance crash, right? There, there wasn't yeah. this big scene in Germany that would have been affected that much. Uh, but of course, we... Um, we felt that too. But I do think that uh, all these situations have in common, that uh, when this kind of stuff happens, then uh, yeah, it's best time to go short on, on different positions and to exactly do what uh, the, the market actually doesn't ask you to do, which is invest, right? So this mm. is like uh, also a very typical meme about uh, stock trading, right? Whenever nobody wants to invest, that's the time. But I'm not a stockbroker or a trader. No. Don't get me wrong, right? You are right, I though. Mean, the I mean, is really now we're looking at hundreds of startups that might be affected, and yeah. uh, now we're looking at some procedures that haven't been in existence back then on how to handle crisis. Same for the yeah. uh, 2008 2009 uh, financial crisis, right? So now it, this is to me, it feels like all these schemes are way more known than back then in the 2000s. Before this uh, dot com bubble, it seemed impossible that it could happen, and after this dot com dot com bubble, bubble, sorry, it seemed impossible that uh, it did actually last that long until it crashed. So it wasn't; it was a bit abstract to to yeah. wrap your, around, your head around this back then. Mm. But, but you're so right in terms of you know, say if there's a young founder who maybe started something as like 2013 or 2012, even they've gone basically 10 years without a crash and they haven't had that experience and, and those hard lessons. And I think maybe the economy in general just got overheated last year. Tech in general just got overheated and uh, yeah, everyone was, was making money. Money was easy to be had. I know there's that saying um, just before the great depression in 1930, uh, stockbroker said that uh, the shoe shine boy was giving him uh, advice on stocks and he knew that was when it was time to get out. Right. When your taxi driver asks you about Bitcoin, then it's time to get out. Yeah. 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 No so doubt. true. I mean, uh, yes, everything has been going up for years and years. But um, yeah, I mean, I don't want to sound like a stockbroker or whatnot because mm. I'm not. But the, it, it's obviously clear that there's up and down in, in, in economy cycles. And you can call them irregular or more more. Um, hefty yeah others are not that hefty um the thing is that you just move on right and uh, deal with the things that are there so um i'm pretty sure there are many people especially in berlin who, like young founders who came to berlin who thought okay this is my future and if i i will be done in my life if i fuck this up excuse my wording um none of that is actually True. I think it's more a matter of first, like everything in life, nothing can replace experience. And then it's like, try again, keep, keep yeah. working on it. If, if your interest in this, uh, in this economy is that big, then uh, why should a stock market, whatnot, make you change your yeah. life fundamentally, and especially holds for the tech area. I mean, many of the tech guys I know, and definitely including me, this is, uh, 
I do this because I, I've always done it and I like it. It's, it's great stuff, right? Getting into business development for me happened later. So I've, I've had a hard time comparing the, this crash in 2000 to some lurking crash right now. Who knows? Yeah. Maybe that's I not think, the topic for today. Yeah, absolutely. I think one last point, because I do want to go back to, to your early days, but there's definitely, I think with some founders or people who have been in these boom times, they think that a lot of their business success has come from them and their sort of magic. And then they tie their success to their own personality and their sense of worth. And then when the market turns and things go against them, they tie that to their worth and, and their worth and confidence goes down. And I think maybe that lesson um, is something that can only be taught if, when you actually go through it. If I think of as me as a young person as well. Definitely. I mean, mm. Success always has many fathers, right? If something goes right, everybody basically tells you, I did it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, when things go wrong, then nobody wants to talk about it. And this may be some uh, pretty simple memes, but they're actually true, I think, right? The success has many fathers and the, also there is this, the winner takes it all mentality or understanding, right? Um, the rock stars in this business get all the attention. Um, if you do it for that many years as I did, like since I was 12, basically, you sort of start to not overrate this because it's a mm. psychological issue rather than a technical issue, right? And if, you, if your next question would be, what does it take to be successful? Yeah, um, I mean, keep on the case, right? For Try many things, right? That's, that's one thing. Right? And this belief of... Uh, um, the American dream. I go to Berlin and then from like cleaning dishes, I will be a millionaire. Yeah, nice fairy tale, but uh, there's not much, not much reality in there. Maybe. No, I brought absolutely. this cup for you in honor of your. Oh, thank you so day. much. <laughs> yeah, the British flag doesn't appear too much in Europe these days, but uh, we won't go there. Yeah, okay, okay, let's. Some humor let's... at some point. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let's bring it back um, to yourself then. So you started your life, your professional career as a software engineer in sort of the, the early 2000s. Um, so how, I mean, how was your career trajectory at that time in the context? Obviously, we're going to lead up to when you started Vimcar, which was over a decade later. Mm. Um, so if mm. we kind of reverse engineer, and you, you look back, in that sort yeah. of 10 year period, say from 2000 to 2013 yeah. or whatever. Yeah. How okay. did that trajectory happen? Yeah. What, when I saw back then in the early 2000s, right, being a tech enthusiast and, and just uh, encountering this entire thing, oh, first startups in Berlin, like big investments and how the entire cycle, how it goes from uh, hype to bust to uh, whatnot. So I've seen uh, many things there that uh, I can now find in, in startups again, right? Most of the uh, issues, most of the issues of how organizations are built and how you make uh, or try to make sure that you can grow and all of that, how you go to market, it all sounds familiar because I've seen it in so many variants, right? And uh, luck is always part of the equation. If something goes right, um, it's a bit of Again, nothing can replace experience. So the trajectory really was that uh, at some point I discovered when like started really, when the scene really started to explode in Berlin, which was about 2006, um, all of a sudden it wasn't just technical expertise that started to interest me, but also uh, work with the experience I had in growing organizations. It's simply because I've seen uh, things go wrong and, and uh, go right. So I had a profound plan on how to do that. Right. And, Something that, uh, like this founder you mentioned, that came to Berlin in 2013, maybe didn't have, didn't have any yeah. idea how this could actually go right or wrong. It was just too well to do it right. So I've, I've functioned as the one who was sort of providing um, the insurance to not make mistakes that uh, others have made before. Right? It's an, a, a topic I have on my list uh, here uh, also. It's called the prevention paradox, right? If you work on, on this kind of level, looking at the organization, trying to avoid the, the real serious pitfalls that, that can really break your neck as a startup, which time is critical, money is critical. Um, 
then you avoid that. Uh, then in the hindsight, some people are like, well, what did you actually do? Right? It's like you paid uh, the insurance and then no accident happens. And then you're like, why did we have this insurance mm -hmm. in the first place? This is called the paradox on the um, prevention paradox on, right? Which should definitely... What's that? Sorry, prevention... Paradox on. Okay. Paradox on. I don't okay. know the right pronunciation, right? It's an intrinsic uh, contradiction, right? That uh, if you, you need in, in your organization, especially in, in the psychology in the psychology of startups, it's always this like, oh, we need the super motivated, super young guys who have lots of power, but no direction, right? And uh, that you would also need somebody who is looking at this entire thing is, okay, let's see how we can avoid the pitfalls to left and mm -hmm. right so we can just move on to try. It's a different role. So are you sort of that person... Because you're right, young founder can get very excited, can get very beat down and sort of ride the, their emotions with the waves of all the external forces. Mm -hmm. So it seems that you're that person that can really zoom out and see everything in its own context. Uh, and when you do that, you can plan where others maybe aren't planning. Yes. Um, and this is not, not magic or something. This is simply due to the, uh, the, the many cases I've seen. Right? There's another... A uh, very common term for uh, um, this psychological context. This is called the Dunning Kruger effect. You probably heard about this. It's that uh, the phenomena that, that people who know least about the the topic they're actually ta talking about are have the the best um, self conscious about this because they simply don't know what what uh, can go wrong, right? And that's very interesting. If you if you want to test somebody on whether he is uh, actually has experience in the field, then give him a real a, a fictional, real big task. And if he simply says, I can do this, right? That's, mm. that's suspicious. You'd rather have somebody who says, okay, oh, that's kind of scary, right? But then you can tell, okay, there is some experience behind this like shiny, oh, I'm so super motivated, right? And then yeah. I'm so super yeah. whatnot genius. Yeah. Right? One of the, uh, I have a sort of a business mentor that just sort of helps me along because I'm obviously still pretty early on in my journey. And one thing she said was you have to know the biggest risks to your business. And uh, anyone that doesn't know those risks or isn't aware of them, uh, it's just a massive red flag to exactly. the growth or yeah. any investors. And for the ones who are in this stunning Kruger situation, they, of course, they don't know, right? I mean, there's, mm. there's simply a quick example of this that's a, uh, Mentioned there is, imagine an airplane full of people and then the pilot dies of a heart attack. And then the steward is shouting around the airplane, who can land this plane, right? Uh, the people who jump at, at this, like, yeah, I can do this, are very most likely the ones that have no idea how to mm. fly a plane, right? And if you can't find somebody uh, who says, oh, shit, this is going to be scary, but I'll try, rather go with this guy because he has seen yeah. some airplanes. Right? Okay. So... If we kind of break it down practically then, so if you are a young founder, you do not have that experience, you don't have that passage of time to, to draw context. So what can a young founder do without that experience to avoid these pitfalls and basically try to do what you can do and see without mm -hmm. that experience you can maybe pass on? Yeah, simply acknowledge that there is a thing that is called experience, right? And simply acknowledge the fact that it might be helpful for you. I mean, for example, I've met some in some uh, circumstances founders who are like, "Yeah, we're looking for a co-founder, but uh, you know what? Got to be uh, super motivated. It cannot be older than 28." And it's like, okay, actually, we can stop right here because this is uh, you're doing this very main mistake, right? You're mm -hmm. denying yourself to uh, to to a, a bigger organization. That has different roles and uh, all, of course you need experience right and one typical mistake is uh, for these seed investment phases is to expect that from an investor right they're like yeah. yeah we have this hotshot investor and he will guide us that's not that much the role of, of an investor to take care of this operational business right so um to answer the question is uh, acknowledge that there is experience that you don't have I mean, how could it be any other way if you're just 28, right? But some people yeah. do, right? Mm. Yeah. So I, to be honest, we kind of, 
I'm probably your example. So I am just, I've just turned 28 and I'm oh, looking to now, no. now grow my company. Um, now, yeah, the way I'm kind of viewing things rightly or wrongly is so obviously when you're growing a small business, especially in recruitment, um, it can be a lot of work, uh, potentially sometimes a lot of hours. So in my mind, I'm thinking, you know, do I, do I employ someone younger and hungrier who's going to, you know, put the work in and, you know, really be hungry to crack on. And I'm almost kind of ignoring the fact that, you know, maybe I could bring in someone older who's kind of seen more of it, um, who can maybe work smarter rather than just kind of working harder. Because I think a young founder who's got a startup, their default is just work as much as you can because you've got the energy, you can do it, you can put in ridiculous hours but sometimes they lose sight that it's about working smart. Yeah. And I, I completely understand because I'm at that sort of, I, I can see things on both sides. I mean, I think the the answer is uh, you need the right mix, right? This is, uh, um, that is, is crucial, right? You cannot uh, like dogmatically lean to one understanding. You got to acknowledge mm -hmm. that there is experience. You also have to acknowledge that you need a lot of enthusiasm, right? Yeah. And this is, is pretty important, especially if you grow tech, right? If you want to build an organization and startups are designed to grow fast. So what is going to happen? You need people who are actually ready to, to take on responsibility, who want that, right? This is a question I got many times um, when I was looking for, for lead developers, right? Which not every, every good technician wants to be a lead developer. But if no. you like sort of sense this, that uh, the ambition is there, and then uh, I would always get the comment, uh, okay, in this recruitment process, there's so little like technical challenge, like coding challenges or whatnot. Um, but I'm challenged here or questioned for, for personality. Yes, that's exactly the case, right? If you, if you hire, if you want to hire uh, or grow leaders, then you hire for personality, not for skills. Yeah. You can always teach skills, right? And uh, to, but to, to develop a sense of, uh, how serious a tech guy is to to uh, become a tech leader? That is that's a very interesting question, right? Because I mean, tech is a lot about the, the producer's pride, right? Engineers need to be put into a field where they can actually um, do their own thing. Nothing is worse than a false delegation in the sense that uh, there's there, you then start micromanaging, uh, right? But then what happens sometimes, not always, but then what happens next step is that, uh, it's another general saying in management is it gets lonely at the top, right? And then, mm -hmm. then you put somebody in this position and tell them, okay, here is what, what you wanted. You have your, your area of responsibility. My role is not to tell you what to do, right? We hire experts not to, uh, not to tell them what to do. We hire experts so they can tell us what to do in this area. My job in this situation is to uh, to pave your way, to to clear out the obstacles left and right. And at some point, some engineers at this point they don't they cannot live up with this. They get scared. They, they act like yeah. okay, uh, wash me, but don't get me wet. Right? And then 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 you see who will actually or wants to make the move from a pure technical expert to also uh, somebody who's actively growing the organization. Yeah. Right? Yeah, it's amazing how many lead engineers I speak to who maybe got a promotion to a lead role and then all of a sudden they're looking for a new job because they just want to get back to being an engineer because people, mm -hmm. well, what they say is that managing people is much more complicated than managing technology. Yeah, I mean, especially startups. I mean, these organizations are built with people, right? This is not a thing you can like calculate, like you calculate a chess game. It's people, right? And the, uh, of course, uh, everybody wants to sort of find out in his life what he actually wants or where to grow and, and where to, uh, what field to move into. So definitely you have the case you just described that there's some technical experts that, that feel like, okay, I've been doing this for five years. Now I want to be a team lead. And then you realize even before they realize that this is not actually what they want, right? And then in order to prevent them to leave, you have to reorganize. Right? And, yeah. and uh, many excellent developers just want to remain in their own domain. Right? They don't want to be micromanaged, but they don't want to to, to manage others. And um, earlier, you asked about my uh, like 
path over the last 20 years. For me, it was like this part of how to grow an organization became more and more interesting. Not mm. only the business administration, but also how to grow a people's organization, how to yeah. develop these spaces, uh, how to, to hire real these kind of experts that you shouldn't tell them what to do because they should tell you what to do in their field, right? You just have to make the room. You have to pave the way because this is how yeah. you can attract talent like in the long run. And the other challenge in startups is all of that has to happen super fast, right? It is not a process over years. Oh, and then you make a mistake and next year you sort of reorganize. It happens at such a fast pace, right? And it really gets sometimes, luckily not, not in surroundings that I work, sometimes it gets so crazy that it's like, okay, by the end of the sprint, you have more developers than at the beginning. And I mean, it doesn't matter anyway, because you're at welcome parties all the time anyway. So uh, it sort of gets to a point where growth doesn't solve any problem because it just yeah. creates an organization that is not focused anymore. Yeah, I think as well, it's in tech, it's the same in recruitment agencies as well. A lot of companies like North Star Metric is headcounts and people lose sight mm -hmm. of revenue per head. And I think as well, maybe in, in the boom years that I've been involved in tech, headcounts being glamorized so much. You know, we're recruiting for 100 plus engineers. We've grown 400 percent in the last two years. Mm -hmm. And I think that that only tells one part of the story, but it's definitely been in the culture. Obviously not this shit or at the moment, but in years gone by. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And if you look at this, watch this for years in, in different uh, settings and different goals, that is more the role of investors. It says, okay, you identify the market, you have a vision about the product, now make whatever you do, do it very, very, very fast, right? This is mm. the, basically the only demand that they have and for little money. Um, and uh, the misunderstanding is that, that uh, the role of investor at this point would be to... Uh, be the uh, senior expertise in the operational business. No, that's exactly the, the stuff that you have to do as a founder yourself. Right? Yeah, absolutely. I wanted to get back to a bit of story time. So Vimcar has been going for a fair few years now. So a big transition in someone's life is to go from, you know, a technician, a software engineer or whatever, or a leader, and then make that jump to mm. founder. It's a big shift. It's a big change. It's a big point of difference mm. to someone. Mm. So I'd love to get an insight into your thought process yeah. those years ago. How did this switch yeah. come about? When was this light bulb moment? Um, yeah. yeah. And how was it also, for you? Yeah. Also a question that I've had before. The, the thing is that looking back at 2000 and, 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 and even before, what we did back then was out of uh, enthusiasm and uh, profound interest in, in, in technical issues and, and uh, being, uh, being a product maker. So there wasn't actually a difference between a founder and an employee. Right? So mm. what I'm trying to say is that uh, I sort of never felt the difference because whatever I did, I always did in my own responsibility. I mean, acting in a in a field where there's only a couple of startups and there's this supposedly big scene in America and then you're in Berlin, um, you always acted as, as founders. So I, I understand your question, but at, at this this issue, I'm probably the, the wrong one to ask because I, uh, I never actively made a transition from an employee to, to a founder because I always looked at what I did as the, the whole organization. Because there was no yeah. other way back then. Yeah, but but surely is but there, there must be an added responsibility because you're responsible for paying salaries, mm -hmm. um, for developing someone's career. Someone's joining your company, and you've got to make it, you know, the best it can be for them. Did you did you feel that responsibility at all? You know, making payroll that sort of stuff. Yeah, of course. I mean, this is one thing that uh, we're, earlier we talked about some super expert engineers in their field, which. Uh, don't actually want to deal with uh, all these organizational, sociological issues of uh, uh, the, the structure of an organization. In other words, um, you got to be willing to communicate a lot, to, to talk a lot, to, to really listen to people, to be creative, funny, the entire thing. And this mm. is somewhat a contradiction between uh, like really heavy, nerdy, genius programmers and somebody who's managing, right? If you have 
just one side of, of this equation, uh, you, you need to find your place in an organization. And for me, it, and that's also a thing, thing that always was there. It, it always was both, sort of, right? Like, with the strong tech background, but then I realized, okay, uh, the, the further I go, the more I want to uh, like learn and experience organizational growth and, and business administration. So this came along the way. But you need to have this enthusiasm, right? Definitely tell you that. Yeah. You, you need to be somebody who wants to communicate, who wants to listen, and who wants to like sketch out these uh, mm. plan for the future, how the organization is built in the future. Like one simple example, if you have a bunch of good developers that have been doing very good work, and then you have to carefully design how you then organize the next team lead, right? Because somebody might feel like, and they don't even tell you because they're too nerdy, right? They, but then they said like, way later, you hear like, why did he get promoted and I didn't, right? And this is the kind of thing that you have to, uh, to sense. And uh, again, I don't think this is a magical gift or whatnot. This is simply you have to be willing to, to listen and willing to communicate. Yeah, you mm. gotta enjoy this. Mm. So, coming back then, then to that idea of Vimcar, mm -hmm. how did your? I uh, you obviously have a founding team. Mm -hmm. So, in terms of like the idea and then launching the company, things like incorporation. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, you had a hypothesis that you thought, you know, if we do this, we're gonna make profit and give value to X amount of customers. Mm. And obviously you have to prove or disprove that hypothesis in the cheapest mm. way and the least stressful way as well. So I'd love to dig into a bit more about, about that period where yes. the idea came about and you had to validate it in that launch time. Yeah. Okay. Um, Vimcar technically is, uh, is uh, built on a thing that is called the OBD interface in cars, which is a, a, a means to get access to the computers of the car. Right. And, um, this is a very, this is a, a technical field that has had high nerd value all the time, simply because, ah, it has been designed without any true authentication, right? You could basically, everybody can access this interface. Um, there's a lot to, to, to gain in, in terms of nerd value, right? So it, like long before Wimka had very, for me, very fruitful discussions on what could you actually do there or break there, right? How can you own cars and all of that? But the thing that at this point in my life was for me even more important that I thought, okay, building something that works technically is challenging, but I, I also want to build a business that is uh, sustainable. And this is what, mm. what sort of all came together with with Vimka, uh, then I thought, okay, this is, uh, now we have these diff different parts of the equation, this idea of a tech saving logbook, um, maybe a niche market, but a pretty big niche. And as it turned out, pretty empty. And mm -hmm. then I thought, okay, that could actually work, right? And that was for me even more interesting to say, okay, this is, I can, uh, building a technical prototype that is beautiful, but only beautiful for engineers is, um, you get used to this over decades. Maybe I'm sounding too senior now, but uh, I, with Wimcar, with founding Wimcar, I wanted to have something that has both, right? Mm. And it was like in hindsight, a very good uh, decision that we focused on this one thing, right? On this tech saving logbook and how to, how to uh, put our foot onto this niche, right? Using yeah. this OBD technology, but not depending on this, right? So it was a very interesting, very interesting time to, to do that. So obviously when you came up with the idea and you said to yourself, you know, this could work, this could be a really good thing to to pursue. Now, obviously you think that, but did you know for sure that your potential customers out there would, would feel the same? Um, and, and was there any process you went through to kind of test that? Or was it just a case of just going for it and just seeing what happens? Yeah, I mean, there's two things there. One is that uh, I knew a lot about the entire OBD ecosystem. And one of the, mm. the things that uh, was there is that there is a legal requirement for cars to have this interface, which in turn, uh, in, in turn was the guarantee that the uh, car manufacturers themselves, the OEMs, cannot simply cut us out of the market because this is what they would have loved to do, right? So they couldn't, could not avoid that, that we uh, install these little dongles, right? Um, 
that was one thing. The other thing was um, looking at fleet, no, sorry, logbook solutions back then, right? Clearly revealed that there is solutions, but their, their usability is, is not good. Right? It's like mentally drawn from, from managing Excel sheets in the back office. There was no notion of, of mobile usability. And so then out of this came this clear mission to build a user experience that is better than everything that has been on the market before. Like go uh, dominantly and very consequently on mobile first, right? And don't start to build another Excel backend whatnot back office, mm. right? And, and the third thing I think was um, to uh, develop some strategy on how to go to market with the uh, with the tax attorneys and cooperation with the tax attorneys. So I, in this sense, I had the the matching founders for me, right? Because I had this this vision of how it's done technically. And then I thought, okay, your, your story on how do you want to bring this to the market actually sounds good to me. This could actually work. Let's try it. So these are the three points I have to mention to mm. answer your question. Amazing. Uh, yeah, it's so good. Obviously, um, many founding teams have that complementary skill set. So once that was in place and you started going to market, obviously the the team and the company started to grow as well. Um, now, I know from, from working with early stage startups, how much personality and cultural fit is important, especially when hiring engineers, you know, it's not just about the tech skills. Um, Cause if you've got an eight person company or five person company, one new person is a large percentage personality to, to get in. So what, and maybe this is relevant for early founders now, what were you sort of looking for in, in mm. your early team? What yeah. sort of profiles were, were out there? Yeah. Now here I can give you a pretty strong opinion on uh, which simply derives out of this uh, experience. Um, earlier we talked about the stunning Kruger effect. Right? The, when when you're in a in a seed phase, you have little money. You, you actually cannot and don't actually want to hire experts with a super CV that have such a profound understanding where they want to go. Um, the funny thing is that you actually start looking for people. Who come to you with the, their head full of Dunning-Kruger, but they they reveal that they have the potential in, in this whatnot area, marketing, tech, uh, product, um, to, to really develop something, right? And then you say, okay, this is you, I want, because I can uh, pave your way, right? You wouldn't even notice at the beginning, but this is exactly how you grow with the company, right? And typically, um, People who are have uh, are talented, are high potential. If you will, the typical consulting term, right? These high potentials, some sometimes also come with a lot of enthusiasm, which is very important at a very young age. But on the uh, downside, with a big ego too, right? So mm. then later you get into this discussion of uh, I did all the work, and what did you ever do? And it's like, yeah, I created your job, maybe. But so the answer is uh, in early phases, don't look for seniors too much. Don't look for people who have like expertise, technical expertise hardly ever solves the, uh, the, the challenges of early startups. It, it's the, the go to market strategy. It's the execution that does. Right? Yeah. Go okay. for enthusiasts to have a potential. Right? Mm -hmm. Then now let's define how you detect potential. Yes. Yes. Uh, often high potential people also don't know sometimes because there's a founder will know they'll see someone young and think, Oh, if you carry on doing what you're doing, you know, you could do great things. But sometimes when someone's young, that they don't know their high potential. Um, so, I mean, yeah, you kind of ask the question yourself, how do you find these people? Hmm. Um, then we're, Back again at communicating a lot right at this point. I mean, this is uh, the, I mean, people try to sound themselves in, in many different ways, but there's this, uh, there's a, a certain attitude that has to do with, with honesty, uh, um, enthusiasm, and these two things, and a, a very vivid uh, mind that can comprehend fast, learn fast, right? And you can test these things. You can especially look for, for people 
give them tasks and, and challenges to see uh, whether they like what they're doing there, right? And then you can sort out the ones uh, to actually do a pretend, <laughs> pretend something because they've read it on, on the internet and blah, blah. I mean, if you can yeah. create enthusiasm in somebody, right? You can uh, reveal a space that they can conquer, They you can make them happy, right? You create more enthusiasm. Right? And then mm -hmm. you have to keep in mind that then your job as to somebody who builds an organization from my point of view is uh, separating these fields, right? The draw the delineation of uh, responsibility. So the people who have a lot of enthusiasm don't necessarily get into the way. I mean, nothing is worse than, uh, like metaphorically speaking, if you take motivated employees and let them uh, compete each other in a 100 meter race and then you let them compete again and again and again this is not what you uh, what will what will lead you anywhere what what you have to do yeah. at this point from my point of view you have to create these two run lanes right create different responsibilities think about it think about the organization in terms of okay let's if everything goes right which only God alone knows and and Chuck Norris um if everything goes right over the next two years, then you will have a middle management. Who of the people who are in front of you, who could just came right out of university, would actually qualify for that or would want to be there or will be there? This is the thinking that's, that's important. And of course, you do that somewhat silently, not getting on people's nerves, right? It's like um, another very old management meme is that your job actually is to make yourself obsolete as fast as possible, right? Mm, yeah make way, make room, uh, financing, office, all these kind of things, coffee machine, <laughs> mate, iced tea. And then uh, when, when they lift off, right, make sure they can lift off and mm -hmm. they don't get into each other's way. Is there anything in, say, an interview, any questions you pose where you can kind of try and dig out these traits in people? Of course, many. I mean, many, many. Let me think of something that's... Uh, um, yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a bit... Uh, it's maybe a bit uh, uh, unfair, but it's, I, I like this question. Right? If, you, if you ask people, okay, um, this is... The, I'll describe the job to you. This is what we actually want to do. How much do you want to earn? And uh, mm -hmm. if that then ends into a lengthy discussion, right, then there's actually something wrong. I mean, the, I would much rather hear at this point, uh, enough, right? I mean, this is a very impressive answer. I got a couple of times, right? Um, talking about the task and then it's okay. Uh, you as the one who's supplying, you need to say, just about figure what you want to earn. And the, the simple answer was, Ah, enough. Let's continue with the tech issues, please. Right? Then I thought, okay, that's that's promising. Right? Rather than somebody who said, yeah, but it, uh, other company offered me a car and, and whatnot and a benefit here and there. These kind of uh, motivational tools are for a later stage. If you mm. in a very early stage and you cannot uh, succeed with creating enthusiasm, then you're doing something wrong. Right? Because then if yeah. you in a seed finance startup, you cannot like wave with a, a, a subscription for the gym or whatnot car. And this is not the this is not the currency that that you deal with in, in early stage startups. You deal with uh, the currency that uh, there is room for you uh, to take. Right. Also, a very important thing. I mean, okay, let's look at uh, this is the, the technical job. Um, what do you think? Um, if I would now leave the room, how would you, how would you organize that? Right. And mm -hmm. at this point, you can see some people, uh, especially tech guys, again, this question is scaring them, it makes them feel like a bit uncomfortable. Yeah. And others get even more started then. Yeah. Like, yeah, even though they are totally f falling for the Dunning Kruger effect, but they, they are like, I want to take on this task. And then you're like, okay. This, at this point, it doesn't matter whether, uh, whether you actually know what you're looking at because you don't. Um, but uh, that's actually my part to then silently organize that for you. That is the currency you're dealing with. It's the, the freedom yep. to do stuff is one of the things that, well, if you ask me about the early 2000s, why was it so interesting to work in startups? Because nobody knew how these structures looked like and it was, there was a lot of freedom to do stuff. 
And to some people, it's like yeah, scary because then I don't know if I would uh, have a big company car next year. And then you're like, yeah, better go to a consulting agency then. Uh, it's exactly not what you can find in, in, in seed finance startups. It's more like if it doesn't appeal to you that there, in case everything was right, there is a lot of ground for you to take. Yeah. Then, um, then that's actually a no. And you can get a clear answer out of people because if you tell them, they, they will either jump on this, right? And get excited about, I want to manage. I can. I want to manage. And they're over enthusiastic. But the point is they are enthusiastic, right? And mm -hmm. then you know, okay, this is what makes sense. Rather than somebody who is like, I don't know, I thought you are telling me what to do. Hmm? Yeah. Yeah. In yeah. later yeah. stages you have that. Once you grow to like a hundred people or more, you have middle management, you have teams, and you have people who have kids, right? Yeah. Uh, something that is very important to to uh, take into account, right? I mean, this is, a, if you're very simple thought that so many people are overlooking, looking, if you have a newborn kid, right? I mean, in 99% of the cases, you do this because you wanted to. And then uh, what would you expect from your company? It's yeah. loyalty and a long-term uh, uh, arrangement or a long-term agreement on what role, what responsibility. You deal with that entirely different than um, in this early state. Uh, yeah. Startups, right? So I've basically, I had this too, right? Somebody who's like a young guy, highly motivated, swift, vivid brain, right? And then, it's, then he said, "Okay, uh, I'm having my my son is like three months old." And I was like, "Okay, we have to be clear that we cannot guarantee here here a job for ten years, right? This could be all over in the next year. That's either we we make the next round of financing." Series A or not, and the answer was yeah, 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 yeah. don't mind, excellent, right? Yeah, um, this is what you're looking for. Absolutely, that honesty, good practical advice for for any founders out there. Um, I wanted to. We've done a lot of like technical stuff and around sort of your journey in business, but I, I wanted to kind of get to know you um, a little bit better. Maybe it's because obviously I'm asking questions through the lens of someone who's who's younger so I obviously see you who's further ahead very accomplished um and that's all I see um but in terms of like maybe young founders will be going through highly stressful situations really kind of deep low moments um now obviously you've been around enough to kind of see the whole cycle but for, from where I see it, you seem quite cool calm and collected you know, heavily experienced, but in Maybe terms today, of, yeah, <laughs> yeah well, it, exactly. And, and I think it's important to get to know, you know, that the whole person. Um, and so in terms of those low points, I don't know, maybe like when COVID hit in terms of the business or have you ever sort of, has it been hair and scare when it comes to getting financing and things like that? Mm. How did it affect you personally? your work-life balance, your relationship with stress. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, that's a very personal thing about me. This is not about the like, general startup knowledge, but for me, it was, it was time to, to have, to do what is called sabbatical, right? This is, I did this for, for so many years and uh, I have kids myself and this routine over years and years and years, which you can only do if you really want it, if you want to communicate a lot, do after our program a lot, all of that together. Over the years, uh, I sort of I felt like I'm, I need a break, right? And this, I had this thinking in my head for, for years before I then actually did it. And a couple, a couple of uh, months later, uh, Corona came. So uh, mm. I was in a sabbatical anyway. So I became a homeschooling teacher, right? And uh, this kind of stuff. So for me, Corona looked very different than for many other people, this, this yeah. space, because they hadn't any uh, operational tasks that yeah, would, um, I was I, like, fell back to uh, consulting or uh, sharing experiences with people when they explicitly asked me about it. Right? Then I can. So it's not because I'm such a freaking genius, just because I've seen decades of, of all different constellations, right? So yeah, 
they simply asked me for an opinion how this could possibly end and then i gave them this my five uh, cents of thoughts happily mm -hmm. but you, you made you sort of mentioned how you you've obviously got to you have to take breaks and have sabbatical but you've also got to earn the right to do that so if you think back maybe to, to your earlier years um for me obviously i'm still fairly young but when I first sort of came out into the recruitment world, I worked a hell of a lot of hours, basically all the time. I was kind of obsessed. Now I look back now and I think, were all those hours productive? No, but I got through the work quicker than my peers. I found out what worked and didn't work quicker than my peers. And that trial and error has allowed me to work smarter um, today. And I'm sure in a few years time, I'll look back now and think, you know, what, what was I doing was, was productive. So that's my view on things at, at 28. What's your view on that? My view is that uh, you're doing the right thing because, I mean, it, it, at the end of the day, it matters whether you enjoy it, what you're doing, right? And this, I, I, I was the very same. I mean, when I was at this age, I was happily working 16 hours a day, like freedom in terms of family, uh, uh, freedom in, in terms of not really money wasn't the primary uh, 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 issue here so i was simply enjoying doing it right and it, it, you can you can test that yourself if you like what what you're doing by the end of the day and you're doing it right i mean the, the more you can uh, gain experience and this can some to some extent only happen if you're in the office with other with real people like working on stuff yeah. it's you can sort of compensate that over uh, tacos but not all of it Right. So, of course, uh, office time, face time is important when, when you want, just want to see and learn and understand the ecosystem more, then uh, you got to go there in order to yeah, become a baseball player. You got to play baseball right? and not mm -hmm. read books about playing baseball. So simple test is, do you like this? And if you do, then yeah. you did it right, right there. What's your relationship with stress now? Do you get stressed much? How does that look compared to maybe a few years ago or back in the day? I was, I guess, like many others, um, I developed like so many techniques to deal with, with stress over the years. Because one of, one of the things in, in doing early stage startups is really you are always on duty. If it's some programming task, if it is hiring, is it some after hour event, it's looking for an office, you're always basically there's something going on. And then you have... Uh, like very young, very enthusiastic guys who wouldn't let you go for at least two drinks minimum. And then you're like, yeah. <laughs> and this, so it turns into a, a job that uh, takes your entire life. So you develop strategies on how to put up with that. And at some point, which not only happened to me, you realize, okay, I uh, gotta, gotta have a, give myself a break, right? Hmm. Then if you ever encounter having kids and then uh, you realize you, you hardly see them because there's yet another whatnot after our event, then this is not good. I mean, this is uh, the, the thing with kids, you have to spend time on them, not money. Right? So mm. what's it good if you, this, you will never have this time will never come back. So these are the kind of thoughts that, that I'm having right now. Right? If you put this negatively, you could say but to a certain extent I was burned out. On the other hand, um, to put this positively, uh, I'm trying to to be of value to to startups where I know most, where I can be best, right? Which is uh, trying to to foresee the the next organizational uh, steps, rather than being the last one at every after hour event who's still standing. Yeah, this is, yeah. yeah, I think as well what people focus on maybe when they're younger. Like you can measure time at your desk, time on your laptop. And I think sometimes people get a peace of mind going, you know, I worked X amount of hours this week. And I think that's probably the wrong and unhealthy angle. Mm. But often, especially when shit hits the fan, people like to revert back to things they can measure easiest. Mm. Uh, talking obviously, about, I come from the sales world, so maybe it's a bit more different now. Talking about measuring, do you, um, I think another very... But also a profound opinion I have, it's never let go on this uh, 
educating yourself further. It is something if things go like fairly right, and then you have your position, and then you start you stop uh, developing your own skills, especially in tech, where it happens moves so fast. Uh, you have to plan this time for your own education for yourself, right? And if you're very young and enthusiastic, then what's the metric you want to learn? And you want to get to know more about how organizations work. How do you do that? You mm. are, you be in an organization, you be there all the time. And for me, it's clearly not, this is not the primary focus to have as much face time as possible. This metric wouldn't make sense for me, for others, it, it would, right? For me, it's more like, okay, uh, keep on reading, keep on uh, educating, right? Be uh, eager to, after all these years, <laughs> yeah. keep up the enthusiasm for, for uh, trying out stuff. Right? But since mm. this is what I did all my life, I'm sort of, uh, I have a good feeling that I will keep doing it. Yeah. So you've always read, always read books. Yes, of course. I mean, it's books. Yeah. And especially in tech, the, um, there's, if you look at just one example, if you look at programming language, there's all of sort of seem to have this, uh, bell curve of popularity, right? And then some, something is coming up like already long time ago with, with Python. Now it's like more like Go and, and Erlang. And this changes so much about the ability to, uh, to recruit people, right? So you gotta yeah. at least know, uh, how, what, what's trendy now, right? Sometimes people come, uh, to me and say, Java per se is boring because that's old. <laughs> like kids don't go to Facebook anymore because the parents are on Facebook, but the worst yep. thing that can happen. And this is the kind of looking at technology that you have to keep up at, uh, at any time. Right? Mm -hmm. People always love to hate on Java. Oh, I do, a, I recruit a fair few Java engineers into Berlin. Mm -hmm. Every time I do a post about Java on LinkedIn, I always get hate from some engineers saying how shit Java is, yeah. but, um, it's just been around for so long. I think people just love to hate it sometimes. Yeah. I mean, it's a very common thing. And if you look a, a bit closer, it's not, uh, um, not backed by technical arguments. It's more like, I feel like I have to go party with my parents, whereas everybody else is having the, the big night out, right? It's a very interesting yeah. psychological aspect, right? Mm. But uh, speaking technical terms, the uh, Kotlin is the major thing to, to go into if you do Java right now, because that's uh, something that is really um, catching up. I mean, the Java is yeah. a language, I would also be one of those cases say this, the entire thing develops too slow. It's, it's been growing so big. And in fact, like 40% of all operated code worldwide is, is all Java and blah, blah, blah. It's, it's not of interest of somebody who is, uh, into the new and trendy stuff, right? It's always this psychological thing of, oh, I don't yeah. know if we end up ending up at the party where my parents go. I want to go yeah. where the hot chicks are. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and that's Kotlin right now. We'll go Lang actually. Um, so I, I wanted to to wrap up soon. We talked a lot about your past twenty years. Um, I'd love to get your view on on how you view, say, the next twenty years of your life and maybe the rest of your career and what you plan to do. I mean, is there an end goal here? Do you plan to you know make millions and live in a big house on an island somewhere? Do you want to stay on the tech? Um, how do you view things right now? Yeah, I, mean, I think nobody would deny the, the million to make, but this uh, claiming I want to make millions is not a goal, right? This is yeah. What's what's that? The what will happen in the next twenty years? I don't know. And I mean, I have visions, of course, what I want to do, which is like. Uh, growing organizations in the way we talked about before, how to create fields, develop people, uh, create responsibilities, all this kind of stuff. More and more, of course, for me, financing is, is interesting. The business administration stuff and how to, how to go to market, how to then have mm -hmm. the other part of the equation, not only an excellent tech, but on how to, how to sell it basically. And other than that, I don't know, because for me, um, 
because it also had this question before, you can somewhat look at the, the work we do now, I say like we, the early tech startup scene, which we didn't know what was there, it was just enthusiasm, but it always felt like somewhat being a soldier, right? There's somebody, you want the job to get done, we are the guns for hire and uh, we get it done, technically. This, that was the approach and I still feel like, okay, this is the, many things you do in life also depend on the opportunity you have. So let's see who yep. wants to, to, uh, who wants and needs a gun for hire and where the, the overall setting makes sense. I cannot tell you what I will be doing in the next 20 years. I know that programming was technical stuff, due diligence, tech due diligence, all, all things, uh, computers was always there, will always be there. Right? That's about all I can be sure about. Mm -hmm. Well, not knowing is probably the most exciting part about that and for many others out there. Well, Lucas, thank you so much for coming on the show. I have to say for me, that was really an education. I've interviewed a lot of founders, um, but a, a lot of young founders as well. And, and obviously they have some great wisdom to share, but I feel like this conversation had, had a different context to it uh, and a different base point. And I think that's got some some real value. Uh, I know it did for me. So and I know you're super busy. So thank you so much for coming on and sharing all that. Thank, thank you. And, and like, likewise, likewise, in terms of uh, you with your recruiting background, very really interesting to see how you set priorities. Yeah. Mm. So I thank you too. And uh, to be continued at some point, who knows? Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you so much for listening to the Building Our World podcast. Every view, stream and download is massively appreciated. If you're new here, then please go back through the catalogue. There's some great gems from some of the brightest and the best in Berlin tech. And if you really like what you hear, then please do hit that follow and subscribe button. That's it for now. But until next time, goodbye.